Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth lesson of our online course uh, on uh, online teaching. Uh, today we're going to talk about energy and engagement of your students and with us to talk about it is Helen Nelson from the Historical Association and Euroclear Ambassador. Helen, thank you for being here and you have the floor. It's lovely to be here again. Um, the world continues to be a bit strange, doesn't it? And um, gosh, I don't know about you, but I am really missing the face-to-face -face contact, particularly with so many friends and colleagues from across Europe. But anyway, here we are. We are where we are. And um, I'm going to spend the, the next, well, 30, 45 minutes, um, might not be quite that long, but sharing some ideas for making online learning a bit more varied and specifically bringing in some debate and discussion or at least um, starting to prepare students for the mindset that will help them debate and discuss so to start them thinking in a in a way that will help them have very different opinions and very different viewpoints and to recognize that other people have different opinions and viewpoints and uh, I'm very aware that um, we've all been thrown into this and uh, this is just one way of perhaps trying to get a little bit of variety in as we uh, move on in the weeks and none of us I think are entirely back uh, at school anytime soon in a what we used to call normal sort of way. Before we start um, even in our online world, and almost especially, I think now we are used to it, we need to remind ourselves of some of our teaching basics, I think. And I keep going back to this, um, both in my thinking about schools, but also actually in thinking about my university work as well. And that's, let's not forget what we hold and we know, which is that a key question is, what do I want students to learn from this today, this lesson? this activity. What do I want students to learn from this is utterly crucial. Second question, what is the best way for them to learn in? How am I going to, in the most effective, efficient, engaging, sanity saving way, get the students to learn what I want them to learn? And then thirdly, how will I know they have learned it? And those three questions, I think, are in some ways crashingly basic. But if you're like me, even as an experienced teacher, you sometimes end up getting so lost in the complexity of the moment that you can end up forgetting the basics. And everything I want to say today is about strategies for engaging students that will only be any use at all if they're actually driven by, by those three questions. So I just wanted to reiterate that before we um, continue on today. Things we have learned recently, um, I think we've learned many things recently, but I know some things that have been kicking around in the other webinars as well is that we just can't teach as much as we used to do. We've got less control over learning and it's really hard to do more than impart knowledge online. And to expand on that a bit then, I think, you know, kids cannot sit in front of a screen all day just doing the same thing. We cannot just teach them all day, just doesn't seem to work. We all know, and this hasn't changed, that some kids are keen and some kids are not. But also that some kids have supportive parents and some parents are less supportive. Um, we know that. We've got a situation where some kids are in really difficult situations. Some kids' situations are easier. These aren't new things, um, but the pain and impact of them, I think, is greater because we've lost the structure of the school day. And as part of that loss of structure, I think we've lost the force of our personalities to support children who really need supporting as well. And I'm sorry to say that I really don't have a solution to that one. I don't think anybody has. We're not living in an ideal world and I don't think we're about to go to online teaching as the preferred method. However, we have got um, quite a lot of agency um, despite that. 
Lots of teachers, though, have been reporting that it's getting across key topic knowledge and dealing with misconceptions that is taking up an awful lot of their time. It's much harder to do the disciplinary thinking, the thinking such as weighing up the value of different interpretations. That is harder, but it is going on well in, in, in many places. I was privileged to watch a recorded Zoom of um, Eurocleo community uh, member Lewis teaching his older students in Madrid about the causes of the Spanish Civil War and my goodness they were treated to a, a really good lecture and then a, a high level online debate. And if you are teaching smallish groups of older students live in inverted commas then I, I will direct you to um, this teaching guide made by the Learning to Disagree team and finished off in the last few months before lockdown because in it you will find a lot of ideas that you can use online um, and the link is is that one that I've got on the screen it's also on the Euroclear website but obviously completely acknowledge that that sort of live teaching is not always possible students can't always be online at the same time and actually live teaching all day is exhausting for everybody and to be frank, I don't think necessarily the most productive way of online learning. Online learning is a bit different. And anybody, anyway, sorry, not everyone um, can uh, or is able or wants to participate. So nevertheless, you might be realising that some form of online teaching is going to be part of your practice for a while longer and you need to be able to get beyond this basic thing of telling student things. So my main focus for today is going to be to suggest some ideas for bringing in debate and discussion even if you're not live teaching or if you are live teaching but you've got very large groups of younger students who aren't quite so able to to interact because sometimes I know in big groups kids just disappear online when you can't look them in the eyes. Hopefully this is going to be a bit helpful um, and make the best use of what we're teaching. So, by way of an introduction, but actually just as an aside before I go any further, I'm not going to tackle anything today to do with digital tools that are out there um, that might also help us get some more interaction. If we move into a medium longer term period of needing to teach online, we might want to explore together as a community some useful tools such as embedding Padlet or more advanced things you can do with PowerPoint. And possibly we could do that in future short sessions, but that's not the purpose of what I'm doing today. Today, um, I'm going to not address techie stuff, but to actually bring in some teaching strategies that are good for history learning and just talk about how perhaps we can use them in our new online reality where beforehand we might have been using them in our in our classrooms. So hopefully that's given you a, a sense of the sort of context and where we're heading today. Every idea I'm going to tell you is also going to fail if students don't have access to knowledge in the form of events, people, chronology, a sense of period. So I'm not about to say anything that's going to replace what we're already doing about trying to give students the knowledge online, um, either by them learning stuff before they get to doing what I'm going to talk about or by having the materials to hand that they can draw upon and access. Discussion and debate are, are very weak as well if students don't have a really good understanding of key terminology in a topic um, and also of the key substantive concepts. So for example students aren't going to be able to debate about the, the Reformation if they don't have an understanding of the term Reformation of course. And if they have no idea about the substantive concept of religion, then again, it's going to be a very, very weak debate. So the ideas I'm going to give you are usually best used after teaching a topic, after doing quite a lot of work on the, on the knowledge, on the contents, if you like. In the example of a really good live discussion I quoted at the start, um, Lewis had really carefully taught the key topic subject matter of the Spanish Civil War before starting students on the discussion and the debate of the material. And I like this image. It works for me because the characters are um, moving about within the book. And I like it as an image because for me, our students 
when they're debating and discussing are moving about within their knowledge, within the knowledge they already have, and also within the knowledge of their peers who might be able to share with them in some ways. But they can only move about within their knowledge. I love that idea. Um, if they've got some knowledge in the first place to move about within. So everything I'm I'm saying um, has to assume that kids know something, otherwise it's I think it's going to fall flat. All right. So what I'm going to do now is is think about a few strategies that I think are debate and discuss and discussion strategies that could be adapted in some way to still work in, in some form online. And the first one I want to talk about is um, something called the dinner party discussion. Now, there's quite a lot of words on that PowerPoint. I'm going to talk about it for a bit, but don't feel the need to read and listen. Of course, the gorgeous thing about online recordings is you can pause me and read the slide and then come back to the talk. Or, of course, you've always got it to look back at later. And that goes for, for all the slides going forward. The aim of this strategy, just to elaborate on that purpose bit a little more, is to enable students to engage with and discuss a range of viewpoints and to understand that a person's background can shape their viewpoint. So that means it enables students to identify when there are overlapping ideas, where there may or may not be opportunities for reconciling viewpoints and also enables them to see some of the, the nuances uh, contained within and between viewpoints on a specific topic. So that is, it's a way of encouraging students to move away from the idea of there being two sides to a topic and towards the idea of a continuum or a tangle of viewpoints, or a heap of spaghetti, if you like. And I would use this if you need students to understand that different historians' viewpoints um, exist, but are not necessarily, as I said, about binary, one side or another side. But I'd also use it if what you need is for them to grasp that there are diverse and complex perspectives from many people on a particular topic. So that's the purpose behind it. That's uh, the aim of it. In terms of strategy, usually the teacher selects a range of people with viewpoints on a topic. About 6 to 12 is, is a good idea. And those viewpoints shouldn't all be polarised. That, by that, I mean they shouldn't all be on one side or another. The ideal is that you're looking for a range of viewpoints that are on some sort of spectrum, some sort of continuum. and an overlap between viewpoints is, is really good for this exercise. The most interesting discussions often take place where there is some proximity of between viewpoints or ambiguity as to um, where people might stand on a particular topic. And those could be views of historians, but they might also be views of other people. I'll show you an example shortly. Students in groups are then given the range of viewpoints and also the relevant background information about the people who held them. And it's this background information that helps students to understand why a person had or has their viewpoint. So you need to give some students some time to, to read the material. Students are then told that they are setting the table for a dinner party. Here's a, a dinner party on the screen. And they are required to place the characters around the table. Now, the table is deliberately an oval or a round. And one way of saying it is place the characters around the table so that there won't be any nasty agreements between the guests. And the idea is that the students then discuss how to position the guests and once they have made their decisions, they can look at the decisions other students have made and question their peers about their decisions. And then they can revisit their own table and discuss any changes that they may wish to make when they've heard others thinking about the viewpoints. So it's essentially a placing a different 
viewpoints round a table in some sort of order using a criteria, in this case, to reduce disagreements. But there are others. I'll come to that. But let's have a look at an example. So, this could be a slide. Imagine I am teaching about Germany in um, the 1930s. I've taught students already about the state of Germany in 1934. I've taught them about the different political parties on offer. And I need students to understand that German people had different complex reasons for being attracted to different political viewpoints. So I might say set up eight characters. I won't go through all eight, but let's imagine there's one called Hans, who's a veteran of World War I, who feels Germany needs the return of the Kaiser and strong government. And he owns a small business and he has a Jewish wife. Uh, let's imagine that Martin is a member of the National Socialist Lawyers Movement, a Roman Catholic, lives in the Rhineland and was born into a big farming family. We might also have Friedrich, a trade union member who works in a big factory and who thinks that workers' rights should be a priority for government policy. His parents are also farmers and he's very close to them. So I won't go through all eight, but let's throw in another possible fourth. Greta, a young woman who has found freedom by living and working in Berlin. And she loves the cabaret. And she is a Roman Catholic by background. OK, I'm not expecting you to remember all those characters. You'd be delighted to know. Uh, but as I was talking, you can probably see some connections. We've got a couple with farming backgrounds and a couple with Roman Catholic Catholicism in common and a couple who seem to like strong government. So you would give them the brief of the eight characters beforehand. And then on this screen, you could say the students could be given then the group of people. and They could write the characters names and their justifications around a copy of this table. OK, so you could give them, send them the descriptions of the people and they could then have uh, send them an image of a table or put the image of the table on the slide. Um, and they could uh, write or type in some way around the table where they would put people. And then simply they could screenshot the slide and send it to a friend for comment, or they could send it back to you as the teacher. Now, what would you be looking for as a teacher? You'd be looking not just for them writing the names of the people around the table, because that doesn't tell you anything. You'd be looking for evidence that they have they're, you'd be looking at their reasons why they have put the people where they've put them. And you're trying to look for evidence that the students have understood that people are complex. So they might have put Hans and Martin side by side because they share a, simple, a similar viewpoint. But then they might have a bit of a question whether that's a good idea, because what about Hans's Jewish wife when Martin was a National Socialist lawyer? Likewise, Greta and Martin share a Roman Catholic background. That might be enough of a point of contact. Used like this, it is simply a device for getting students to think through the complexity and implications that, of that using the knowledge of, of Germany that they've got about Germany in 1934. OK, so the, the way I did that online was literally by using um, uh, them sending them the stuff beforehand, but then getting them to to screenshot there. They could draw out a table, put the names round, screenshot it and send it to you. An alternative way of using the table, though, would be to give students um, extracts from historians and um, a note about the working context of those historians. Oh, say, for example, if you took historians that have worked on the outbreak of World War in 1914. At the dinner table, you might have the historian Franz Fischer. You might have Christopher Clarke. You might have Margaret Macmillan. And students could then think where their interpretations would be placed around the table. So putting historians next to each other who have similar or different interpretations. 
So in this case, you'd be, you could also ask students to place themselves around the dinner table as well. Where would they be sitting and why? Do they want to sit next to Christopher Clark because they're most persuaded by his perspective and why? Or would they rather sit next to Franz Fischer? What is it about his perspective that appeals to them? So the students would actually do a little writing task to accompany their placing. Again, their placing could be them simply scribbling out a round oval, pardon me, putting the names of the uh, historians around the oval and their own name and then writing um, a short piece about why they've put themselves there. And it's the depth of what a student writes that will enable you to see if they've understood the topic and the perspectives. Of course, you don't have to just do them writing something and screenshotting it and sending it to you. You could ask the students to record their thoughts and you could listen to them. But there might be a teacher workload issue there. Um, although they could perhaps record their views for each other and then write up a final view for you. There are lots of different things you can do, but it's, it's just a suggestion as to how we might get some um, discussion of either different perspectives or different historians' viewpoints into some of our teaching. OK, so something with a dinner table. That's some ideas and hopefully you can come up some, with some better ones. Another one of the uh, ideas that I think is adaptable is the uh, problem of saving the sinking balloon. Again, remember, you can always stop and read the PowerPoint or you can uh, uh, listen and then, and then stop later. I, I will spend some time with it. So please notice as we're going through this, there's quite a lot of paper based work happening. All things can be spoken into recordings, but we are trying to use the, the skills and the attributes of people who can reason and argue in these activities. And then one day when we all get to meet each other again and have a good chat, hopefully um, we'll have got some of those reasoning and thinking skills practiced. And this one is a bit dark in some ways. It's about uh, throwing things out of a sinking balloon that are less important than others. But actually, essentially, it's about making decisions, reasoned decisions. And this example I've made up here are about five developments of the Industrial Revolution. So imagine we're the students. Let's take five developments we have studied. Oh, let's go for the train, the bicycle, the stamp, the steam powered cloth machine and the smelting of strong iron. Any five developments of the Industrial Revolution that you've studied would do. I'm just using this as an example. And in order to keep the air balloon afloat, we need to order the developments for most to least important impact of the Industrial Revolution. What has Which development had the largest impact on human society? Is the impact from the Industrial Revolution that was most consequential? So, which development is least important in your view as a student? That's the one that's going to get thrown out first. But of course, most importantly, they've got to explain their reasoning. Let's see how a student might write it. Now, again, this is a little bit, um, as we would say in the uh, UK, this is a little bit Blue Peter. Here's one I did earlier. I sketched this out really quickly. So, on the left, at the top, sorry, the most significant development of the Industrial Revolution. There's my little balloon. But hopefully it gives you an idea of what a couple of things might be. So I decided actually that the most important thing of the five for the Industrial Revolution consequences was that was the smelting of strong iron. And I've put there, look, that reason's important because without the smelting of strong iron, all the other developments were impossible. It underpins the progress. So then I decided that number four, um, second most important consequence, was the travel by train. There's a little very bad drawing of a train. And my argument is that letters, cloth, food, all the other goods that were uh, developed more uh, substantially as a result of the Industrial Revolution, food prediction, cloth manufacture, postage of letters, they were all completely useless in large quantities if they couldn't be moved about by rail to sell to people. Um, and so that would be uh, my other reason. You get the idea. And kids would hopefully do something a bit neater and would give you a complete set of reasons. The reasoning is the important part. You could give students criteria for making their decisions. 
or you could let them decide their own criteria and explain what criteria they've used to you as well. You could set up students commenting on each other ideas. But if that's a step too far, then at least, again, if they do this on their own and send it to you, it's a way of getting them to use the knowledge you have taught them to make reasoned decisions. And you can challenge their thinking either in writing or you could record for all of them and encourage them to more depth of thinking by putting different perspectives and sharing your thinking with them. So again, we're trying to get kids to uh, use all the information that we're imparting to them at the moment. Okay, this idea um, is something that you can use with perhaps older students. When students have studied a topic, you could give them an extract from the work of a historian. The more obviously opinionated the historian, the better. Because what we're looking at here is how a historian makes an argument. And that can be quite revealing for kids to help them think about how they can start to make arguments. In this case, I've chosen an extract from a book by Simon Sharma, who is an example of an opinion who wears, sorry, of a historian, not an opinion. He is a historian who wears his opinions very obviously. And that's very useful for students. They can read the text and as long as they've got knowledge, they can find all the ways using his language and their knowledge that Simon Sharma makes his opinion very clear. In this case, it's use of language and the mores of the time that he's using to be very opinionated. In other parts of the book, there are specific detailed evidence. Let's have a little look here. So I've stuck a couple of arrows just to give you some examples and I would always recommend giving kids an example to start them off. So that top line, the British Empire Lord Curzon could state without fear of contradiction, Again, he's using the mores of the time there. India was not a democracy under British rule, is the knowledge that the kids could use. And down where I've put the second arrow, puffers of empire, possibly slightly complex English word, sorry about that, but puffers is a derogatory word. And so um, you can tell by reading this that Simon Sharma's tone is um, against uh, the British Empire's rule of India, very negative about the impact of British rule in India. And by actually reading the work of historians when they have some knowledge of a topic, students can be helped to see that history is an argument, that words and ideas and facts indeed are selected to build arguments. If they are historical, they can be verified but that doesn't make them incontestable. So I would say do some work with historical arguments to show, sorry, historical interpretations to show argument. And as I say, what I've done here is annotate to get the students started. They could then find some more uh, examples of where Sharma is making his opinion very clear. And they could write a summary of Sharma's view and talk about how he expresses it. If you've got younger students, then you could do this with a short clip from a historical movie or even a not very historical movie, like a clip from, oh, I don't know, in the UK, it would be Disney's Robin Hood or a piece of writing from a, or a picture from a children's history book. You could do it with that, too. So it can be uh, adapted for for younger learners. OK. My next thought is an example using a historical illustration and huge thanks to Michael Riley from University College London for this view, um, this idea. Overall, what I'm saying all the way through here is let's not forget that the discipline of history can show us a way into making clear to students that history is about argument. Sorry, I knocked my, my keyboard there. Um, history is about argument. Now, you could get kids to have a look at this 
and say, right, this is a historical illustration kit that's drawn by somebody in the later 20th century in this case. What impression does it give of a late medieval town? Pretty much every young child I know would like picking out some of the things there. It's disgusting. Look at that poor guy that's fallen down in the mess. And if you look a little bit further back, oh, we've got the traditional view of the woman throwing all the waste out of the toilet. And that couple look with their child have just missed having a load of rubbish thrown on their heads. Mm, delicious. It's every stereotypical view of a medieval town. But then what you can do is say here, okay, well, this historian, Carol Rawcliffe, I'm only using this as an example, wrote a book. Her book was called Urban Bodies. It was about, in this case, English towns in the late Middle Ages. It was a study of local manuscript sources with archaeological remains and it clearly shows that even if the people in medieval towns didn't always achieve what they were trying to do the rulers of a particular medieval town in this case Norwich in the east of England and most of it the people who lived in Norwich really did appreciate the importance of trying to keep the place clean and to have sensible health measures and you could ask students to use their learning to give evidence in support of the illustration. So evidence that could say that our historical illustrator was not entirely wrong. Some things about medieval towns were pretty smelly. But you could also ask them to use the knowledge they have, which suggests that Rawcliffe was also making valid points. Some of them might even enjoy redrawing the town to fit Rawcliffe's view. Again, something perhaps for, for younger students. But again, it's getting across this idea that we've got different perspectives. It's laying that important thinking which will help them take into account different perspectives and different views in future. I absolutely just can't resist deviating a bit here slightly because this is just a gorgeous image um, of Hadrian's Wall. It's the northernmost limit of the Roman Empire and it's a bathhouse. Now you will also have archaeological digs in uh, your particular locality or you might want to use one that's from the northernmost part of the Roman Empire, something that unites us all. But when I saw this historical illustration, it's just absolutely gorgeous. That's an interpretation of that bathhouse. I'll just go back again. As you can see, historical illustrations, just gorgeous if you can find them. And you could ask students how the archaeological remains have informed the drawing. You can find similar examples of um, archaeological remains or buildings today and then uh, illustrations to go with cathedrals, to go with mosques, to go with castles. And that's, again, something that kids can use their knowledge. Okay, it's going to stay with the uh, pictures. Part of being able to discuss and debate, I think, is about being able to put yourself in another's shoes, and we can never do that entirely, but we can try, and it needs practice. And in the pre lockdown world, I would have made everyone in a class a person in this image, and I would physically have got the class standing up, positioning themselves exactly to replicate this image. You might have seen some of those on things like Twitter. People are in lockdown making themselves into pictures. It's some great fun images. And we can actually still do something like this. We could give each student a person to focus on in that picture. And we could ask them to stand in the position of that person. OK, they may not have other people around them, but they could still take the body position of that person. And then we could ask them to use their contextual knowledge of that scene. Again, can't do this unless they know things. But they then could imagine with their knowledge what the person might have been thinking. You could then give them or you could direct them to more sources of information about the person's role. For example, if they were stood being the, um, just pointed at the, the couple of sorry, the three officers chatting here, you could give them some information about uh, officers in World War One, Or you might want to give them some information about the role of women who became nurses in World War One, 
or people who worked on the railways in World War One, or in this case, people who worked in voluntary organisations that were preparing some sort of relief and help for people, or possibly uh, spreading um, news bulletins. The students can then be asked to reflect on what the person in the picture might have been thinking and feeling in the moment and then can be asked to share them with everyone. And if they share them with everyone, you'll soon see that even in the same picture with the same kids doing the same imaginary activity, you're going to have different perspectives, different feelings. You could ask them, what do you notice about how the different thoughts and feelings have been imagined? How easy is this as an activity? Question it. How confident do they feel about doing it? What might be the advantages to a historian, though, of allowing themselves to use some imagination? There are obviously drawbacks, but historians do use imagination because the historian uses imagination to then think, OK, what interesting questions come up that I can go and see if I can find some evidence to back up my ideas? To be honest, any image that's got lots of activity in it, any piece of artwork like this or any big photograph, could even be something non-historical, something citizenship orientated, can work for this sort of activity. And again, it's about um, getting kids to relate, getting kids to realise there could be different perspectives on the same thing. Okay, that's probably enough ideas for now. Um, but one thing I did want to finish off with is that we can also let historians do the work for us on this. In this period of lockdown, there are, there are more and more historians who are putting uh, their debates and their ideas online. And I've put a few on here. Um, many are open access and they've got a wide range of uh, applications to school history. So there are many, many debates on YouTube. I found one on Napoleon that I thought uh, might be of interest to quite a few people. Um, in Our Time is available to everybody. It's in English, I'm afraid, but they do debate on historical themes, uh, particularly useful for older students. And um, there's even an example here of a recorded school debate. And you might want to uh, share that sort of thing with uh, students so that they get an idea of how you can debate and then perhaps get them to set up a debate um, between two or three of them and see if they want to record themselves and then load it online for them. That might be a way of putting in some quite nice high stakes challenge for kids. So just to be aware that there are lots of things on there where we could actually um, model debate. OK. I'm going to stop there for today. I hope that's given you some ideas which you can most importantly improve on for um, perhaps bringing in a little bit more creativity in one particular way to our online learning. Thank you so much for listening. Please stay safe and well. I hope we'll meet again very soon and do share your creative ideas with us, please, via the Euroclear Facebook page so that we can all um, continue to learn and uh, get better at this uh, weird world that we've been uh, thrown into. Thank you.